Well, hello there, all you marvelous people, and welcome back to Africa, where we are back in the Hunter Call of the Wild. This, of course, is An Ecologist Plays, a channel where we are learning more about nature by playing games. So, stay tuned to see what we can learn about the African savanna as we go along. Now, our objective is clear. We need to harvest three more springbok here in Vusha. And that is, of course, in this general area right over here. You can see I've got a few little bit of hunting pressure here and there, but I'm going to head into this direction over here. It's a relatively open plain, and I'm hoping that there are some springbok in this area over here. What we do have is, of course, a lioness that is walking over there. I'm going to leave her alone. We are not going after lions at the moment. My objective is to get to the springbok. Now, they should be grazing on these open plains. I think we're at the end of the day. Yeah, we're at the end of the day. So they should be probably just walking around grazing at this time of day. They're not going to be hiding under the trees. Generally, I don't think they'll be drinking at this time. Uh, so they should be somewhere on the plains. And I'll be back with you in a moment. Alrighty, now it is the next morning. And that means that if we head over to this area over here, that is a feeding zone for the springbuck or of the springbuck. And that means they should be in that area at the moment. If we can just put up a tower then close-ish to them, we should be able to take out a few of them without causing too much hunting pressure in this area. So let's just double check and see whether they actually are where they are supposed to be. Not quite, but they are in that area apparently. If that is alright, we are going to put up a little tower right over here and sit on it and then we are technically hidden even though we are definitely way out in the open and then we are just going to call them closer and this of course this little contraption over here the idea is that it simulates the kind of warning call that they are giving and of course whenever one of them hears this call they would want to go and investigate not because they are necessarily inquisitive but because they need to know where the danger is and what the danger is so that they can actually respond appropriately. Not the biggest set of horns on him, but that is at least one springbuck that is coming closer. Just checking to see whether any other are coming closer, but it does not appear to be the case. It appears to just be the one springbuck. Okay, he's less than 100 meters away. That means we should be able to take him out. like that all right we finally found him now i've just realized that this quest of ours to uh, kill five springbuck is not even the main quest we are on the side mission i'm going to harvest this one and then i'm going to go on to the main mission three springbucks down two more to go so what i'm going to do is just quickly get the main mission up and then we are heading to this area over here. And we're going to hop over to that outpost there. Okay, we are a little bit over one kilometer from the site that we need to go to. And of course, we have got mountainous terrain and we've got thickets between here and there. So we are quite possibly going to encounter some buffalo, uh, which I am not necessarily very excited about. So to help with the journey, of course, I'm going to take a little bit of a drive on the Roigefaar, the Red Danger. So, off we go. And there go the buffalo as well. Oh my word, a whole herd of them. Surprisingly agile on rocky terrain. Nice big herd. Looks like quite a few cows in there, quite a few females. No males there, so that would appear to be mostly a breeding herd. What you'll very often find are that buffalo will... They've got very interesting social structures. Yes, you'll have the herds where there are bulls and cows together. But you also have what are known as the Dugger Boys that I mentioned previously, I think two episodes ago when we were actually chased by a few Dugger Boys, where the old bulls will tend to move out of the breeding herd I will very often be lying around away from the rest of the herd where they are chilling at water, water holes or in mud pits. Basically, dugger means mud, so it's the, uh, it's the bull, buffalo bulls lying around in the mud, very often 
thick with mud on their hides. But they are basically, they, they f at that point in time, they're not necessarily breeding. They are actually recovering their strength. And once they are strong enough, they again they take over breeding rights and they push out the other males. Those males may become dagger boys themselves again, recover a bit and they move into the breeding herd again. So over time, they tend to move between being part of the herd and being on their own. That herd over there was most likely a breeding herd, but mostly consisting of females. Years and years ago, I saw a, we saw a herd of buffalo oh, must have heard, numbered a few hundred strong in Kruger. Almost only females with their calves. So there were females in there, but that was a big breeding herd. As I have a mission over here of hitting every single small tree in this part of the savannah. Because now that we are closer, I am just going to jump off the Roygevaar and just go Some on foot. Some from a Marshall College in Connecticut, USA, came to restore a site they claim is among the oldest human artworks ever discovered. Hmm. I need photos of the restoration for Furanga's new website. It's on your way to your next gig. Scratch two birds with one shot on this hike. Okay, so we're going to be looking at some cave paintings. So that's really, really awesome. I have uh, seen a few Bushman cave paintings in my life, which is always so fascinating and awesome to see. My favorite one was this one, where it was a massive wall of sand rock art or Bushman rock art. Uh, I was While I was doing my data collection for my masters, uh, the landowners told me that up along a little creek there is a cave, and in the cave there, there are some amazing paintings. Of course, while collecting data, as I was collecting data for the for my masters, I then obviously had to go and have a look and look at those amazing cave paintings. And boy, oh boy, I was not disappointed. Now we need a place to go in, I think. Should be some kind of cave entrance around here. Very often cave paintings, at least the ones that are still around, that we can still access, that can still see, they are in very, very sheltered areas, like massive caves. Ooh, this looks promising. He'll be rolling down the mountain when he goes. Ah, okay. Oh, yes. This is a massive cave. Oh, my word. Now, if you see a cave like this in Southern Africa, you can be almost certain that inside you're going to find a whole bunch of animal remains, very old animal remains very often, and are going to find quite possibly some There's cave paintings as well. Site. You got your camera? Yes, Grandpa, I've got my camera. Easy to go into camera mode. You just press P for photo. Let's just have a look here. Now, these caves will basically be very... Oh, there's a little fern growing here. Oh, nice. Not a Blechdom species, but it's one of the typical South African ferns, actually, that we've got here. I have not seen any ferns elsewhere in the game. Only here at this cave. That's quite cool. They actually put a little bit of extra effort into this cave it seems. There's some more ferns up there as well. Of course, ferns do like shaded and wet environments and that's why they are growing around here. Uh, water will, of course, whenever it rains, water will drip down from the rock face over here, drip down to the ground. This area would probably be a little bit, be a little bit wetter than the other areas. And of course, it will be shaded as well. Mm. It gets morning sun as it is now. It's currently early morning, so it will get sun until about midday and then it will be shaded for the rest of the day. It is shaded in the middle of the day, which is the important bit for them. Uh, yeah, ferns generally love shaded environments. Anyway, uh, with these caves, you can have kind of like a snapshot of what things were like in the past. With the animals that are present in the painting over there, the animal bones you can find, the human remains you can possibly find in the caves as well, all those types of things. So let's have a look and see what the cave painting actually depicts. Wow. Okay, so let's have a look here. Of course, we've got the human shapes there. So there, that, of course, a whole bunch of humans all the way around. Very often, especially in Bushman paintings, the uh, bottoms are exaggerated a little bit, a little bit more. Sometimes the bellies exaggerate a little bit more. This just goes to show that they were taking care of themselves quite well. Uh, one thing that is missing are the uh, <laughs> phalluses, uh, the uh, male genitalia, which you will very often see in uh, artwork like this, kind of to show virility and to show how 
well, not necessarily how manly they were, but to show the virile, basically. Uh, so very often you'll find that, although I think they were probably trying to make it a little bit more PG. But yeah, of course, this scene does depict uh, a typical hunting scene in South Africa. It seems that most of the Bushman paintings, not necessarily hunting scenes. Yes, you will see that. But the Bushmen also had a more spiritual connection to the animals that they were sharing their land with. And they would actually paint things that were of value to them, not only for hunting, but spiritual value as well. The eland, for example, which is most likely the big antelope species that we can see here, they were especially important for them uh, in, the, in a spiritual sense. And that it could almost be guaranteed that if you come across Bushman paintings, you are going to find some eland in there as well. Wow, really quite well done. Now, of course, they would have painted the, made these paintings by mixing certain uh, clay or certain rock. Ochre, for example, very often ground down, giving that ochre uh, color over there, that reddish brown color over there. That was then mixed with animal fat and that then smeared onto the wall. So, uh, yeah, not a vegan painting this, but it's a beautiful one nonetheless. So, let's photograph it. Now, of course, Grandfather did say that it is, has been restored. That's probably because it was degraded over time. And then the university, of course, just came in and did some of the touch-up work. Now, I'm not sure how good of an idea that is. If it were damaged by humans, yes, it should be restored. But you just kind of like, it would be like painting over the Mona Lisa. Uh, so, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily be very keen to restore uh, the, paint, uh, the cave paintings. But, yeah. Anyway, let's photograph this. All right, here we go. Marshall College does surprisingly competent restoration work. Uh, thank you for getting this. All right, wow, got quite a bit of cash for one photo. <laughs> now, continue to the Zonga, to the place marked on your codex. We need you to collect some water samples from the swamps. Don't get uh -huh. squeamish on me. You've done well so far. Now it's time to get your hands dirty, and your feet, and your legs. <laughs> In other words, Grandpa just wants us to get extremely muddy and dirty. Yeah, these are sand paintings. Okay, great stuff. It says about 10,000 years ago. Of course, the sand or the Bushmen, they were the original inhabitants of Southern Africa. And they were similar but very very different from the aboriginal people from australia for example uh, where they also had these kind of kind of paintings uh, to depict life and their spirituality and unfortunately also they were of course hunted by um, other people when they came into conflict with him uh, because the sand were hunters they were not farmers they didn't have herds of livestock they just saw livestock as you know some other animals to hunt and when african herders and when europeans came into southern africa and moved into the areas where the sand people were living they just kind of saw their herds of uh, cattle and sheep as food that can be hunted they don't have the whole concept of uh, possession in the in the bushman culture you didn't possess anything you didn't actually own anything and so they kind of just saw these weird four-legged creatures as something they could hunt. And of course that then brought them into conflict with African tribes and with Europeans who then systematically proceeded to almost wipe them out in Southern Africa. Now in South Africa you do still have a few areas where they are found, although they have mostly uh, mixed with Western culture as well. You do find them still in Botswana in some areas, in the wild areas of Botswana. You may still find some uh, more traditional Bushman uh, lifestyle still being lived, but not quite as they did uh, a few thousand years ago. By the way, you've got a good eye. Uh, hopefully your brother won't reject your photography as insufficient <laughs> composed or some fancy crap like that. He's very picky about what he puts on his new website. Who made him the arbiter of good taste? Not me, I can tell you. <laughs> But I'm paying him to make the website. So maybe it was me after all. <laughs> anyway, welcome to Zonga, where every insect on the planet is waiting to greet you. 
you mm. received the inoculations, right? Uh, the ones I specified on the checklist I sent you. It was very important that you get all the shots, not just some of them. I hope you got them all, for both our sakes. I wonder which ones I was supposed to get inoculated against here. Yeah, I would guess um, it would be some kind of thing, something like yellow fever or dengue fever or who knows what tropical diseases we have here. Of course, going into the swamps, which are in the lower lying areas right over there. I mean, you can see all the, all the little pools that have formed. Perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes and mosquitoes, yeah, apart from humans, kill more humans than any other creature on Earth. Uh, things like malaria, for example, really a horrible, horrible disease. And that has killed a whole bunch of people, of course. Uh, best is not to get bitten by the mosquitoes in the first place. But if you do, then you would hope that you actually have some drugs that could resist the effects of the, or the severity of the plasmodium uh, protozoans which are then of course in your bloodstream so the protozoans the plasmodium they are living in the mosquito move to the salivary glands and then when the mosquitoes actually bite you they also do put an anticoagulant i think is the term for that basically a compound that prevents the blood from actually clotting so that they can drink freely and when they inject that saliva into you the plasmodium the protozoans then move into your bloodstream as well and then they will multiply and then of course you have malaria and then eventually another mosquito will bite you it will drink your blood in the process the protozoans the plasmodium will then move into the mosquito's gut eventually mature go to the salivary gland and the whole cycle continues so it's a two host parasite it needs both the uh, mosquito as a vector or as a transmitter and it needs a warm-blooded host in our case humans uh, but they can also affect a variety of other animals as well depending on the plasmodium species some species of plasmodium will also affect birds and that's a major problem on hawaii for example where bird malaria or avian malaria is wiping out large populations of endangered birds I'm just keeping an eye because there are some buffalo to the left hand side there and I'm not very keen on meeting. Hmm. Anyway, uh, but now, of course, with climate change as well, areas that were previously too cold for the mosquitoes to survive are becoming perfect for them to also still survive in, and especially higher lying areas where the mosquitoes were kept out by the cold conditions. Now that is becoming suitable for them, and areas that previously didn't have malaria last year. Are getting malaria. You got this close to the swamp, all you hmm. would hear were tsetses buzzing. Tick, 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 tick. They are bad, bad bugs. When our drought began, animals started clustering at fewer water sources, hmm. and the tsetse flies clustered with them. That meant TNT, tsetses and trypanosomiasis, a virus that forms nagana in livestock. Nasty disease. Very bad. In humans, the same virus forms sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness, eh? It's no way to die. Anyway, the problem was the clustering. So we broke up the heads as best we could. Aggressively quarantined sick animals. We had help from all over. All hands on deck. This year, no more tsetses. Tsetses, yes. Tsetses are the, well, tsetse flies, basically. It's a type of biting fly, type of horsefly type biting fly. Yes, 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 I hear you, Fricky. Okay, anyway, and they are like mosquitoes, like the Anopheles mosquito will transmit malaria. The tsetse flies will be transmitting the Nagana or sleeping sickness. So the Nagana in livestock, sleeping sickness in humans, which is, as grandfather here said, a really horrible disease. Uh, it's uh, typically found in the warmer areas, again, like with the malaria, generally not found in cold environments. And I think tsetse flies are found only in Africa. So it's a typical tropical Africa disease. Okay, that uh, warthog at the back is really not happy with us. Anyway, and interesting what grandfather also mentioned is that the clustering of animals basically bred disease. 
Basically, the more the creatures were contained in a small area, or concentrated in a small area, the more easily the disease spread. And that is true. You'll very often find, especially with kudu, for example, and anthrax, you'll find that as the population density actually increases beyond a point, there may be things like anthrax outbreaks, which will, of course... Um, just checking what's running there. Okay, it's just a rabbit. Which will, of course... Uh, kill a whole bunch of the kudu and then the population drops again and the density of the animals will drop down and then it kind of fizzles out the same thing here with the tsetse flies at the watering holes or where the watering holes were basically as the animals were dispersed into a larger area it was lower density of herd animals and then as a result fewer tsetse flies and less outbreaks interesting the zebra's black and white pattern may actually have been a way for them to reduce the likelihood of tsetse flies actually landing on them. Uh, it may be camouflage, yes, against and disruptive camouflage at that, against things like lions, but it also very well could be a form of disruptive camouflage against tsetse flies. And I'll get to that in a moment. Let's get some swamp water. That's how it goes. Hey, take another sample from the site marked on your map. Okay, let's get the second sample from the swamp. Of course, I think we're looking at... I'm not sure whether we're looking for parasites in the water, things like uh, the uh, parasites that cause bilharzia, or whether we are looking at nutrients in the water, things like nitrogen and phosphorus and organic matter that results in eutrophication. Not sure what we are doing, but we'll, I'm sure we'll find out as we go along. Anyway, tsetse flies and zebras. So there's done a bit of research in the past regarding why zebras are black and white, why not just black? Why not just white? Why not green? Uh, why not brown? Why black and white? And if you're looking at all the horses around the world, the zebras are the only ones that are black and white. So there must be some kind of evolutionary advantage to being black and white. And what they did is they actually made horse figures, uh, so horse-shaped and horse-sized uh, trolleys on wheels, and then they sprayed that with an insecticide that would kill anything landing on the uh, model that they've made. And then they painted some models black, some models white, and some models black and white. And they found that more tsetse flies landed on and were then killed by the pesticide in, on the black and white horses than on the this black and white ones. Work, right? Too easy, maybe? <laughs> then you should be able to get it done faster. Okay, let's try one more. Last one. As I was saying, so more tsetse flies landed on the models that were black or the models that were white than the uh, horse models that were black and white. And the argument then was that maybe that black and those black and white lines actually make them a little bit better camouflaged against tsetse flies, which is an interesting, interesting concept and would explain why zebras are actually black and white and no other horses around the world are black and white. Because looking at social horses, you also have things like Przalski's horse, which also occurs in small herds, yet they are light brown in color. And they were predators back in the day in Europe as well, and would still be in many areas where horses are found. So why on earth are no other horses black and white? It could be that the tsetse fly is only found in Africa, so therefore only the major African horse species had to evolve black and white stripes. Just an interesting little concept. I like it. Anyway, let's get our third sample over here. Thank you for mocking around. Your brother will submit these samples for testing. You're welcome, Grandfather. There's also a lot more work to do here in the Zonga. With the river drying, Mohamganyi, wildebeests are migrating through the reserve. So many, they don't realize they're going to starve themselves by depleting the grassland. Your job here will be to focus on saving the wildebeest from overpopulation. Just check your mission log when you've got time to spare. Okay. Hey, I almost forgot, grandchild. That shot you took of the restored painting. Your brother sent it to a photojournalist who frequents the reserve, Flip Osprey. Flip was impressed with your eye. I told him you get it from me. Here's some more assignments for you, if you're game. 
Helping him will put a little extra cash in your pocket and promote the reserve while we're at it. Right this moment, though, you have another priority. Flip Osprey isn't the only foreign media we've had touring for hunger. This German Hootube guy <laughs> or whatever, yeah, Gustav Baden, he calls himself a world-famous ghost hunter. I took one look at him. I said, if this man sees a real ghost, the only thing he'll do is turn a paler shade of white. <laughs> Your brother thought it was better to humor Baden for the Hootube views and exposure or whatever. So I let him come with all his fancy gear and his cameras. What a fool I was. He's not been here two days. Two days. Mm. And already Gustav Baden has gone radio silent. Without our guidance, between the poachers and the buffalo... This European Mampara is going to get himself <laughs> killed. Go to his campsite, give him your spare radio, and talk some bloody sense into him. He should have a camp set up to your west in the area marked on your map. To the west should be that direction. Okay, there's the campsite. Alright, but that is where we are going to be calling it today, everybody. So thank you very much for joining me on a little African adventure. Hope you had a great time with me. And hope you learned something new as well. Of course, if you've got any questions whatsoever about any of the animals or the landscapes or anything we saw, please do pop it down in the comments below. And if you haven't yet, please do subscribe. It really helps the channel to grow and uh, get some more exposure in the YouTube algorithm. You guys are awesome. Thanks for staying with me. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week. See you guys next time. Bye.